<laughs> Obviously, mainstream media is not doing it, so I feel like I need to do it. The problem, get out of here. I've been wrong countless times in my life, and I will continue to be wrong. Maybe this isn't a good thing to say, especially because we have three cameras out still. But this is Gen, a fearless YouTuber disrupting the billion-dollar news industry by investigating both sides of some of the most controversial topics in the world. So today I'm out here, and I'll be asking both pro-Israel and pro-Palestine what they think. Do you think it's racist to want to secure your border? What do you think a father brings to the table that a mother doesn't? Do you think religion is about control? Do you think fat shaming works? You guys have tried to force her to say the N-word. Oh, it's bad. I'm trying to capture these voices. You were doing something wrong by censoring the voices. Today we delve into Gen's unorthodox strategies for creating content that reaches millions of people. I think gone are the days where you can just be creative and authentic. And discuss his transition from corporate life to YouTube and the challenges of balancing this unfamiliar career path. For example, right here, those people right there, we could rob them. We could rob them and take their car. It's always kind of like a internal battle, maintaining authenticity while still having to consider clicks. Welcome to Creator Confessions, comfortably uncomfortable conversations with creators on a couch. Hey, what's up, man? <laughs> Dude, I'm excited. I'm super excited. Feeling? Uh, comfortable, tired, a little bit burned out. We were just talking about it before that, like you've been on a crazy run. Like you just posted this Israel versus Palestine video. You were in New Orleans filming videos. Came back last night to yeah. Austin. Today you tried to do this three hour live stream. Yeah. About a Jubilee video that you made. Yes. Uh, and that didn't work out. And now you're here. So yes. like just saying that makes me tired. <laughs> well, Yen will be answering three questions. One from each jar of increasing degrees of vulnerability. And the third question will be paired with a comfortably uncomfortable self-care activity to help him de-stress. Oh, yeah. My girl's always telling me I need to do this shirt. Okay, cool. We're starting with level one? Yeah. All right, let's do it. Is that one? Right. So if you were to die today, what's the number one advice you'd leave behind for aspiring creators based on your biggest mistake? Ooh. I think my biggest mistake was not hiring an editor quick enough. I think that's probably the, one of the most obvious advices that I think a lot of YouTubers are give. But I think, you know, so I think going along with that, quick as possible, try and build out a team that one, obviously you can afford and, you know, be happy with, but someone that you can like genuinely see long-term. I think editor is huge, especially because doing anything creative is extremely, I think, taxing mentally. So to free up as much time and mind space as possible is gonna be really important. And I think sometimes um, creators who are extremely detail oriented like I am can get super slowed down with production by being not only like the person in front of the camera, but also behind the camera editing. So I think quick as possible, identify what your strengths and weaknesses are and write that down, but then also look at that list again after checking your ego to see not only what those strengths and weaknesses are, but what should I outsource even if you think that you're good at? Going back to the editing, like for you, what do you feel like took you that long before outsourcing? Like where was the resistance? Was it letting go of the creative process? Yeah, definitely. And again, kind of like ego thinking mm. that no, no one can edit like my style way. But it's like, no, I was probably just not really comfortable with my own leadership skills to be able to teach someone. So I think a lot of creators think that we're like extremely special because we can edit in such a certain way. But is that the best way that's going to get as much results, views or impact? You know, if that's the most important thing that's driving your mission, mm -hmm. um, then you need to consider that over how stylistically you can do your edit. Wait, so how long did you wait until you did hire an editor? I think for me, I waited until I believe year or two in. Yeah, I actually hired him this year. And I think that was one of the best decisions I've ever made. So what does that process look like? Is it like, do you just send him all the raw footage and then he takes care of it? Do you give him some more guidance? For the content that I've been doing, which is what I like to kind of bucketize it as street interviews turning into investigative journalism, I actually map out like the storyline. So I have like a pages, like I think every video I have like 30 pages of outline notes, creative direction I want to take it. And script by script, I lay that out on a um, Premiere profile. So potential interviews that I want to be used. And then the next bucket is like my transition or commentary. So I lay that out for him. But then once I pass that on to him, he can then focus on what he does best, which is the creative ask about it. Overlaying the music, the sound effects, and maybe even putting out or, or eliminating some interviews that it's maybe redundant, right? It's kind of like the second pass before it gets to that finished product. Whereas going with that too, is that I recently started doing a lot more investigative journalism 
documentaries where I actually go to these things. We're gonna explore who's behind how things work here, what the city is doing about it, and trying not to overstay our welcome. So now we're gonna figure out that next stage. What is it gonna look like now, right? We've worked together for like a couple months now. Do I want him to now just give him that footage and now he goes and cooks? You know my style, mm -hmm. you know, you, you're you looking at this footage. Maybe he might be the one who says the story. So we're figuring that out actually like this week. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Do you feel resistance towards that? No, because I think, I mean, I got extremely lucky, but I fully, fully trust him. I think that's something that I've had to learn a lot as a content creator is like letting go and hiring right. I think this next stage of YouTube, I think gone are the days where you can just be creative and authentic. Now you have to kind of like think more like a business to make it a sustainable career. And that's one thing like looking into your journey that I think is really inspiring is that you were so intentional about how you started. And when we were at Vid Summit and you told us the story of how in I think 2020, you're having a bit of a midlife crisis. <laughs> Many midlife, met midlife yeah. <laughs> like what? Not midlife, sorry. Uh, you know, More quarter life. life. 20 and you decided to write your own eulogy, mm -hmm. and uh -huh. that's what led you to then find your purpose and the mission behind the channel. Can you talk a bit about that? Like how that came to be and how writing your own eulogy actually helped you identify the mission behind the channel and the business. Yeah, it was interesting. I think I got this like idea from no joke, like a Skillshare course. And I totally forgot who made that Skillshare course, but I probably looked up like, what should I do with like my life on Skillshare, right? <laughs> Things you do when you're desperate and going through a 22 year old midlife crisis. But I think one of the advice that he gave was to write out a eulogy. So I was like, okay, I'm willing to try anything. So I did. And from that is where I essentially gleaned, like, what do I want? my life to look like like what do i want my family and friends to say and i think like part of the exercise too was like to stream of consciousness write it down on a piece of paper and then afterward right sit down and maybe like start circling and finding some commonalities and themes on that document that you just like wrote out from that was essentially how i literally came up with like the mission statement that i still have defined today which is i want to live authentically and courageously to inspire others to explore the unfamiliar i don't know what the hell that was going to manifest itself into into the medium I was going to do that in, but that's literally how this has happened. Why defining that kind of sentence is how I decided to take it into YouTube. I was uh, doing YouTube as like a kid. I would always make like stupid little like comedy skits. I would even, I was also a big soccer player. So I would always like edit like my own like soccer highlight tapes to like send out to college coaches. So even though like I wasn't doing YouTube actively, whenever there was like school English projects or something like that, I would always jump on the opportunity to like edit a video, create it and, and submit it as like a school assignment. And I would spend hours, like literally all night, like creating an edit on like fucking iMovie or something. So I like that passion was always there. And at that time I was also taking a lot of like public speaking classes called uh, Toastmasters. So it was kind of like combining a lot of like these disciplines that came about. And I was like, oh my God, I love YouTube. I obviously know that we live in a di digital age where content can essentially allow you to network at scale. All those mediums combined together to essentially do it through YouTube. Why are you so passionate specifically about your mission of inspiring others to explore the unfamiliar. What is it about that that you're so passionate about? Yeah, because I think I've worn a lot of hats in my life. Like I just mentioned, right, I used to be like a soccer player. That was, I think, like my first obsession growing up. But after I quit soccer, I've done different things like join a fraternity, right? I mean, you guys probably couldn't have guessed that. I even like did a, did a stint where I was a barber. I was like, oh, oh really? I, a cool skill that I think will be cool to learn would be maybe either DJing or barbers. I was like, DJ, like everyone's trying to be a DJ. So I started watching YouTube barber talk, uh, you know, stuff to, to learn on my own. So I'd cut like people in college. I had like a stint where I would study abroad and I was that worldly guy that likes to travel and explore different cultures and also so growing up like in a dual culture where I'm Japanese as well as, you know, living in America, I feel like I've been able to fit into so many different types of crowds. This isn't like a self plug or anything, but I think a lot of people say, oh, I can talk to anyone. But I genuinely feel like I'm one of those people that I can actually talk to many different types of people, no matter their socioeconomic race, whatever it might be. I find a lot of value in that. I find a lot of value in talking to different people. I, I've been wrong countless times in my life and I will continue to be wrong. With the whole media climate going on right now, people are scared to talk about things. People are more quick to side with whatever side they feel like they need to align with, where they feel like they where they can't get canceled. And I think that's wrong. That's gonna create more division than unity. So after considering all those factors, that's where this Explore the Unfamiliar has started to now look like we're gonna explore different social and controversial issues that people are talking about, but don't wanna say this quiet part out loud. And we're gonna put it out there. 
We're not going to tell you what to think, but more so how to think by presenting all these different perspectives and you as the audience decide. Because again, I've been wrong many times. Who the hell am I to tell you that what you should think? I'm, I'm curious on that. Like how much of the type of content that you're making now comes from a place of genuine passion to explore the unfamiliar versus knowing that these more controversial topics are going to get the clicks and have a lot of chance to go viral? That's a great question, man. Yeah, to, to be completely honest and frank, right? At the end of the day, the currency of YouTube is views. It's always kind of like a internal battle, maintaining authenticity while still having to consider clicks, mm -hmm. right? I think that's where that whole kind of business mind also has to come in now, I think with this stage of later stage YouTube, in the sense that you can't just be a creative making beautiful shots anymore. I mean, you can, but are you gonna be able to build out a team? Are you gonna be able to parlay that impact into the world? I don't think so. So of course, you know, for example, this week, right? I just made a video where I talked to people on both sides on the pro-Palestine and pro-Israel debate. So today I'm out here and I'll be asking both pro-Israel and pro-Palestine what they think. The occupation of Palestine is the cause of all evil. The only way to stop violent men is with other violent men. So although that is something that I wanted to genuinely explore, it will also be a complete lie if I didn't know that I was going to get views. If that wasn't the most controversial topic that's happening right now, I think I'm kind continually battling that. But I think at the end of the day, as long as I come up from a genuine place uh, when I'm conducting the interviews or when I'm putting out my message, that's at least something that I can hang my hat on. The nature of the videos that you're making is really controversial. Have you experienced any negative effects or like consequences on you as a person, you, the people around you as a result of doing controversial content? To be honest, I thought I was going to get more. I, I can only count probably on the my fingers the hate emails that I've gotten or like the hate DMs. Maybe I just have short term memory loss when it comes <laughs> to that stuff. But um, honestly, I thought that I'd get more. To address that issue, yes, we are definitely covering a lot of controversial issues issues. I'm also viewing it from the fact that it's actually not controversial. And that's also what I'm trying to convey through my videos is that, look, I am just asking questions to both sides. The only reason why it's controversial is because now we're too scared to actually talk to people that we disagree with. So once we take that out of it, is it really that controversial? Or are we just making it out to be more controversial because we're so zipped on everything that we can talk about these days? Have you ever felt fear whilst you've been conducting these interviews on the streets? You know what? Um, probably that Palestine and Israel one was was something that I felt a little bit nervous about considering that I didn't really know too much about it until like I decided to do this like the night before. So that's when I started doing like a lot of like research so I can prepare like the questions and stuff. Just but the night before? Just the night before. Wow. It was literally, I was on a flight last week coming back from San Francisco and then I was like on my plane's Wi-Fi and my team was like, you have to do this video. And I was like, Oh, I was looking forward to an off day. But then, yeah, I found like a protest was going to happen that next that next Sunday. So I jumped on it and did so. At this point, I don't really fear that, feel that much fear anymore. Maybe it's because I've just done it so many times and talked to so many different people. But I think part of it too is that I'm genuinely coming from a part where like, I'm trying to capture these voices. You're doing something wrong by censoring the voices. The reason why you're out protesting right now is because you're exercising your amendment rights. Why can't I do the same? You know, like... The only reason you're able to do this without getting shot in this country, at least, is because we have these like amendment rights, right? I think considering that as well as like, I'm coming from a genuine mission of like trying to get this out to to people who may not know too much about this. And obviously mainstream media is not doing it. So I feel like I need to do it. How has that impacted you as a person and emotionally? It's a lot to take in. Yeah. You know? Is it something that f you feel like you're able to, you know, like block out or is it draining for you emotionally? I'm sure it probably affects me. I think early on when I really started finding this format and rinsing and repeating, I was like, wow, I feel like drained after these interviews. Although intellectual discussions were very curiosity inducing, I felt like very drained. I was like, why is that? And it was like, you know, it's, it's kind of like why you probably shouldn't be consuming the news all the time. You're constantly consuming negativity. Even if you're a very positive person, that can seep into you, whether it be subconsciously or consciously. So I'm sure it's had an impact, but I think more and more, if I frame it in a way where like, look, this is part of the mission, I think that's helped me stay focused on 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 the course you know you're obviously going out into the world and exploring these topics that are unfamiliar but how has that helped you 
explore the unfamiliar like that's within you is that do you feel like that it has rubbed off in any ways personally that it has helped you like unlock certain things that you weren't aware of before about yourself yeah absolutely and i'm glad you touched on to that because essentially the mission of exploring the unfamiliar isn't just these you know weird extenuating circumstances or stories it's actually you know what i'd say in the mission too is that it's internal too mm. Whether it be your fears, your self-limitating experiences, all that is very unfamiliar because you haven't really searched into it. Because whenever we like voice like complaints or sad feelings that we have, I think that's why therapy is probably like beneficial in some ways is because once you voice it, you're probably like, yeah, it's not that big of a deal, right? Like it really like gets, once you can really get it out of your head and your internal thoughts, a lot of things become a lot more familiar. And once things become a lot f more familiar, it becomes a lot more digestible. I, I think I've always had like a natural curiosity and a natural ability to talk to many different sorts of people. But I think this has tremendously up leveled that. Another thing too, that has been a huge mind shift doing these different things is also, I'm not really surprised by things that happen anymore. Whether it be, you know, my girlfriend that I I met through the videos that lives in Brazil, my team members from India or Montreal to, to Dallas to all these different places, none of it surprises me anymore. In the sense that once you start like exploring these unfamiliar things a lot more, things that are still unfamiliar becomes a lot more familiar. So everything starts becoming more digestible and it's like, yeah, I understand why that can happen. So I started seeing opportunities more. I relate to that a lot, but I also think on the flip side, sometimes there is the negative side to that, which is you also start to appreciate those things less at least personally sometimes i was like it becomes so like normal that it's you know you almost take it for granted have you i mean based on your smile i feel like <laughs> there's something there but yeah guys a great question so far by the way um yeah definitely definitely mm -hmm. i i've noticed that I, I think this happens to people who travel a lot too mm -hmm. it's like yeah. <laughs> the more you travel, the less you also become surprised by other countries you go to. Humans can get used to anything. Yeah. It's it's kind of scary. Is there is there anything that you're actively trying to do to be able to, you know, actually appreciate everything that has been happening in your life? Like the crazy experiences yeah. that you're having, the success on YouTube. Do you ever take any time to soak it all in yeah I, I mean maybe this isn't a good thing to say especially because we have three cameras out still but having conversations like this always help and ground me and mm -hmm. stay appreciated mm -hmm. um especially like you know cultivating new and existing relationships that's like the most that's grounding thing one. you can do as a human but right we have three cameras can <laughs> we say that what do you mean we're you know? <laughs> it's just it's just us awesome, I, I guess yeah but yeah honestly like talking to loved ones and and cultivating like actual deep conversations whether it be on or off camera it's what's helped appreciate it anymore Level let's do two. it okay jeez okay okay <laughs> do you ever feel like a disappointment to your parents as you pursue a youtube career man at this point i think they've given up on me no i'm not kidding um you know what what helps is that my older sister did the doctor route, so they made the Asian parents happy already. So I think it got a lot of pressure off my hands as the, as the only, you know, son and middle child. Uh, that, that definitely helped. And if I was an older, older like sibling, I'd be f***ed at it, you know? Yeah, but I told him like, uh, I believe earlier this month, right? That I'm going to be quitting my full-time job at the, at the end of this month. And of course, my mom was like surprised. Mm. And initially, like throughout the YouTube journey as, you know, sub count was only at like, 10 50 and then 100 you know it was just like oh i'm sure you're just doing it as like a fun little thing you always used to do it as like a kid but then as like the numbers started going up right like whenever we'd have conversations they wouldn't really like mention it or anything or they would just be like oh how's your little youtube project but it's like as the numbers went up she'd be like oh my god you're already at this but you just hit 100k they started to have more and more interest as like the let's say the successes went up but yeah i guess like going back to what i was saying is when i told my parents about it my mom was obviously surprised but i think at this point too she's like knows that i th i think i've been able to build up enough trust apparently like my mom and my dad uh, talked and they were essentially saying that I think Gen's just gonna live a life that we won't understand. And I was like, I think that's probably like the most Asian way of like saying that. Yeah, except this weird mother. You know? <laughs> like, what, what are we gonna do? He's not gonna listen to us anyway. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'd have to just probably think though that this is still a pretty rare, I think, sort of reaction that I think an immigrant parent would have. But 
I don't know. I think they've also been able to see how like hard I work with it, how I've been able to, you know, find a way in, in many aspects. I like to think that they, they trust me with it and they've kind of just accepted it. Is probably the right answer. When you started your YouTube channel, did you have the intention of creating, like leaving your full-time job at one point? Were they aware of that? Like, did they understand the vision that you had? Yeah, I mean, I told them, I was like, guys, like, you know, when they were less like, oh, I was your little YouTuber. I was like, you guys know I'm gonna quit like my job and do this full-time. I'm telling you guys now. <laughs> Just a and it was not like, <laughs> it was like a thousand, I was at like a thousand subscribers saying this shit. Like, so yeah, I guess, yeah, of course, I think, you know, there's a lot of doubt and there still even is like doubt, right? With 10 days to go before I quit. I think more and more the steps that I've taken, the more I became confident with it too. And what I've also helped reframe my mind throughout like these moments of doubt is like, why am I worrying about problems that I'm not even on a stage to even worry about? Like I would worry about, oh, once I quit my job and you know, I'm running a team, how am I going to make sure I like run a team? And it, I was worrying about those things before I even hired an editor. I was like, I'm going to figure it out. Just like how I've been able to figure out this step of the way. Of course, there's going to always be new challenges. And the more you grow, probably the more problems you're going to have. But you're also going to be a lot more equipped to be able to handle that too. Whether it be emotionally, psychologically, confidence, esteem wise. But also just the skill set that you've seen these different sorts of patterns before too. That's why it's like, you know, if you strip Elon Musk of all his money connections and all that, he'll probably be rich again in like a year or two or two. It's the same thing with Mr. Beast, right? Let's take away everything that he has. He's going to be fine because he has the skill sets, the mental fortitude to be able to do it. What were the skill sets that you learned whilst trying to sustain a full-time job, run your YouTube channel that allowed you to sustain that for as long as you did coming up to 10 days where you're now gonna quit your job yeah and just like how the f did you manage both <laughs> both things like let's be let's be yeah honest. the natural gift of adhd i guess that, that, might, that helps i think i've always been good with time management I've, i played a lot of like travel soccer where we would travel a lot for soccer too while still maintaining like high level high school courses college as well so I think that helped me train up my time management. But again, right, just like we talked about, if you want to take things up to a level, the things that you are doing aren't going to work. You're going to have to up-level that. I think I've had to up-level my time management. I've also had to up-level, I think the biggest thing is emotionally maturing. It's like if one shitty thing happens at work, are you going to carry that into your shoe? Because then if you carry that into your shoot, no one's going to want to interview you. And even if you get someone to interview, that interview is probably going to be shitty. I think being able to compartmentalize and use your mental energy on the things that actually matter over frivolous things is something that I had to work on and mature a little bit to be able to get to this point. Obviously, I'm still learning. I've had to cut my stream short today because I was getting frustrated over technical difficulties, like a child. Like, well, that was like, <laughs> as I look back at it too, I was like getting pissed, cussing out of my, like, myself on stream because I was getting frustrated because my mic wasn't working. Like, it was on stream as well. It was, I was like, <laughs> and I was muted. I was muted, it's like, <laughs> like you know so like obviously i'm still figuring it out obviously i'm not perfect from a practical perspective like how are you managing you know a full-time job because you're working at salesforce right mm -hmm. so how do you manage that and how are you able to grow a channel to almost 300 000 subscribers i, I think another thing i had to work on too is getting rid of a lot of perfectionism mm -hmm. i think that helped a lot the more i've been able to outsource and mm -hmm. that's allowed me to think not like a employee but an employer and i think i've been able to translate a lot of those skills that i've learned while i'm still an employee at salesforce mm -hmm. how can i do this task in the most efficient way as possible mm -hmm. right because my time is limited and i would rather not be spending my mental energy on that but then still deliver excellence i'm not gonna do a job on my job they're still hiring me i still have a job to do and i think what helps too is that i was able to at least be in a job where it has played into my strengths as well mm -hmm. right I'm, I'm in sales so i'm mm -hmm. always talking to customers and that skills that i've been learning right whether it be professionalism for a huge fortune 500 company talking to other fortune 500 executives that's also helped me translate it into how i run my youtube 
or how I present myself on camera. So it's it's helped that it's uh, kind of like cross-functionally helped each other out. But I think the biggest thing is efficiency and how I can translate what I'm learning with YouTube to Salesforce, Salesforce to YouTube. That's a great skill to yeah. learn. But at the same time, I remember when we were talking on Bit Summit that it seems like you've learned how to work smart, but you're also working really hard because you were telling us that when you would end your job, then you would, you know, start start working on your youtube channel until like 1 a.m that's a i mean that's a crazy schedule to sustain as well what do you feel like just gave you the the energy to to do that i try and take care good care of myself mm -hmm. whether that's eating healthy mm -hmm. exercising though that's been lacking the last week or so yeah just finding different ways where i can get energy i was feeling very tired coming here but like right now i feel very energized that's also just helped like the work in and of itself energizing mm -hmm. me right when i figure out a great way to storyboard this video or an idea that I'm genuinely excited about executing on. So even though let's say I'm like mentally and physically probably tired, like emotionally I'm excited. So I've been able to derive a lot of energy from the work that I do as well. I feel like that's so important yeah. because like even with doing YouTube through my own experience with our channel, like the, the content we were making before would drain me. Like every video would drain me until we switched to this, having conversations with people. And now I'm, I, I don't get drained. Yeah. You know, so that really is a great point to like make sure that you're you're stay in tune with how you actually feel while you're doing your content. That's a huge sign. Like if you're feeling like you're burnt out after one video that it's like maybe that's not the one that's right for you. Right. I'm also curious about like, you know, you quitting your job. What took you? quote unquote, so long, because yeah. I feel like from the outside, somebody would look at you and be like almost 300K on YouTube, like <laughs> on a great trajectory. Like, what is this guy doing working at Salesforce yeah. and yeah. Like staying up or like having this tiny window to work on his channel? So what took you so long and why do you feel like now was the right time to do it for you? Why not 100K? <laughs> Dude, it's fear. Mm. I guys told you guys still like 10 days to go and I'm, I know I'm going to do it and I will do it, but I'm still scared. I'm so scared that I'm gonna essentially take away my training wheels or my safety net and go into the volatile world that's like YouTube. Am I still good enough to do it? You know, all the different things that we all have these like self-doubt doubt in. That took a while, but I think it genuinely for me, since I've gotten so good at being able to balance both, that it had to get to a point where both were gonna become unsustainable and I had to essentially choose. Essentially it was like, I had to get to a point where both Salesforce and YouTube were gonna put guns on my head and I had to choose one or the other. Because earlier this year, Salesforce had like layoffs, you know, the tech layoffs, like half my team was gutted. So this year it's been even more busy as my YouTube has grown the Salesforce workload has grown as well. I've been like traveling like the last five weeks or so, um, not only for YouTube, but for my job. It literally had to get to a point, I think, where I was like, yo, I cannot sustain this. The pace I'm going right now is not sustainable. I think it literally had to get to that point for me to do so. But so have you like, you're saying in 10 days you're, you're done? And it's official. It's official. Okay, so you already handed in your notes. No, no, I'm oh. going to hand that in on that last day just so I can make sure I get the bonus, you know, because I'm uh. working too damn hard for, to not get that. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. I also think another misconception in the YouTube space is the financial aspect of mm -hmm. like how much money do creators make with a channel of your size? Do you feel like you're in a place now with the YouTube channel where you feel a little bit more comfortable in taking yeah. the decision because of the financial Definitely. I had like a number in mind and I can say like around like 10 to 15 K that I wanted to reach to where I was like, okay, now is the time to do it. I can, you know, pay my team, but then also I don't want to do this and be poor, but like, you know, like I'm going to be honest, if I'm going to quit my job, I want to, you know, be there. Mm -hmm. Um, but obviously I'm going to go through ups and downs. I'm yeah. probably going to make some lot, some mistakes. I like to say I'm ready for that. I will be ready for that. Yeah. I think I definitely think you will. I mean, Thanks. it seems like from looking at you that someone you're someone that's very intentional, super hardworking. So a hundred percent, you'll find your way. And it seems like you know that yourself. Yeah. As well, have you always had that like confidence in yourself of like, yeah, I got this, or is that something that you developed? Definitely developed. I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I think, but again, I was too scared to. That's why I'm always like sometimes seeing like these 20, 21 year olds who didn't go to college and just just did it. I was like, wow you have that conviction like that young that's that's crazy but there's no point in making comparison games right i also had to go through different 
these different things to get to this point. Yeah. And I think I have almost, honestly some advantages over some creators in the fact that I've worked at a pretty big ass company, man. Mm-hmm. I know how like these companies work, um, or at least to like a surface level. And I can translate that into how I run my own shit too. Like some some of these like 21 year olds, although they might be very like rich and flexy about it, they're probably not that professional to work with. What so. is it? What do you feel like are the biggest takeaways that you will take from working at Salesforce and apply to YouTube? The importance of building a company culture. I think Salesforce is honestly like one of those companies that's like great to work for. Mm -hmm. Like so many people, even if they leave, they even have a term called boomerangs that come back because like they've, I think, done such a good job of branding themselves in a certain way. So I think it's like not making it. So I make my team's job so abundantly easy where it's so obvious that they want to stay for me and, and work uh, for, for the mission. That as well as I think just professionalism, right? We are talking about these more social and controversial issues. So we need to be that much more professional in our communication with brands that want to work with us because obviously there's going to be some hesitancy. I think after they watch our videos, they'll see that like, were actually not controversial, at least in my eyes. So I, I think it's about bringing that professionalism of a huge corporation and translating that not only internally, but externally in our communications as well. Yeah. From your experience, like, would you encourage other aspiring creators that have that entrepreneurial spirit within them? They already have the foresight that they want to grow a successful channel so that they can create a business out of it. Would you encourage them to work first? at a conventional job or would you would you say i don't think they need to if they have that conviction and if they feel like they have that skill set then then do it Mm -hmm. then just go ahead i think i've had to go through these different things to be mature enough to handle it but if you feel like you can do it and you have that conviction then i don't want to say waste your time but go for it in this conversation you brought up a lot this theme of treating youtube as a business so how are you viewing, you know, your channel and YouTube right now as a business? And how do you plan to make it something that is sustainable yeah. down the line and that can grow beyond just the views that you get on YouTube? Yeah, because the thing about the YouTube is extremely volatile, right? You obviously have unlimited upside, but that also comes with it unlimited volatility. I do not want to rely on just views for money, man. Mm-hmm. That is a quick way to essentially creating another sort of job for yourself, mm-hmm. right? A lot of people talk about this now of how the creator world is essentially like an upside down pyramid. Mm -hmm. So when I think about a business, I'm thinking beyond YouTube for sure. And I'm thinking about it more in the sense of like a media company. Let's talk about, for example, no matter what side you're on, I think everybody needs to applaud what Ben Shapiro has been able to do with the Daily Wire. Mm -hmm. But essentially creating a media network from popularity he's been able to build on YouTube as a personality, right? And he has creators under him, Brett Cooper, Michael Knowles, all these different sorts of personalities. And he's been able to build that. Couple that with like Vice, right? Vice obviously has had a presence on YouTube, but they became bigger than that. I know right now they filed for bankruptcy and such, but what they've been able to do is very, very impressive. So how I see my vision is to being able to do that. Vice as well as you know, kind of like that daily wire, having creators under us with like their own personalities, with the own flavors that they bring, whether that be daily news show or reactions or you know hardcore documentaries like vice has been able to do Mm -hmm. that's how i see it in terms of creating a sustainable business right our Mm -hmm. own platform where people can subscribe to Mm -hmm. instead of just youtube man because again especially with what we talk about youtube could just be like y'all and just book you off i think that's how i see it in terms of building a business right not just relying on assets and sponsors Mm -hmm. although i'm grateful for it that's maybe the stage that i need to be in right now but as quick as possible man i'm trying to create businesses outside merch subscriptions all that how do you imagine that transition going from the channel being you as the main person on it to then becoming the channel where you're you're having several other people doing interviews doing these different things that you imagine that's a great point and obviously if i had the answer i would i would be doing that now i think slowly and slowly making it so it's not about me, right? Of course, my channel name is Gensi right now, but making more like the explore the unfamiliar be more of the brand. I think it's gonna be a slow transition. I think it's possible. I think I'd always wanna be maybe like in front of a camera, right? I think more of the vision is to really be able to replicate the things that I'm learning, replicate the systems that we're building into more of a media conglomerate or a company mm-hmm. in which we're able to scale. Cause we're not gonna be able to scale if it's just me. It's not. With the mission I want, no way. Level three. All right. Oh, wait. Oh, wait, it's different. 
Okay, okay. We wanted to change things up a bit. Since you mentioned like, you feel like you might be burning out soon as well, this felt really appropriate to do. So we're trying to introduce this theme of like self-care into our videos. <laughs> I feel like your mind is going to like, yeah, I know. what the fuck are they going to make me yeah. do? <laughs> um, we're going to be doing a... Uh, we're gonna be upping the ante on this one. Okay. So instead of it just being more vulnerable, uh -huh. we're gonna add a bit of discomfort sure. into it. Well, Rich, like... bring it out then. <laughs> so, okay. no strips. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, my girl's always telling me I need to do this shirt. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we're gonna have to, we're gonna put them on okay. and then we're gonna set a 15 minute timer. Once that timer goes off, <laughs> we're gonna have to rip them off. It can be a bit. Tingling. <laughs> Isn't it gonna come up? No. Is everything recorded? <laughs> so good. Put this on me, and now they're about to rip my nose to shreds, <laughs> making me look like Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. What is your most controversial opinion on the creator space that you may feel afraid to express? I don't know. If I would say I'm afraid to express it, but. One, I guess, controversial opinion that I have on the creator space is that I honestly think that, I mean, most creators are going to fail. I think one thing I've been thinking about too is like how many creators do you know from like the early ages of like YouTube that's been able to sustain it to present day, right? Like who's still even doing it? So I think one, I think one thing is obviously the algorithm is always going to continually evolve and change. People's tastes are going to change. People are also just going to come and go, right? As they enter different stages of their life. How do you keep capturing the younger audience than the older audience, right? Like how do you mature with like your audience? I think you're going to have to continually innovate. A lot of people get really mad when creators like innovate and they're always like, I miss the old Gen or I miss the old whatever, right? I miss the old Mr. Beast. But you're going to have to do that if you want to sustain relevancy, for lack of better words, in the creator economy. Mm -hmm. And I don't think many people consider that. Mm -hmm. So that's why I always say like you have to consider that it's, it's a business. Mm -hmm. right entertainment is one of the most cutthroat industries for a reason and it's entertainment at the end of the day that's what we also forget too is mm -hmm. that you can make the most beautiful films or whatever but if no one watches it doesn't matter that's why titles and thumbnails are important right mm -hmm. and it's probably ridiculous that i'm saying all this with something <laughs> on my nose but but it's entertainment right that's why we're saying this with stuff on our nose <laughs> right so I, I think the most controversial opinion is that you know most creators won't if they make it you know, how are you going to sustain it? I think most creators uh, consider that. So I think I'm actively considering that. I, and, you know, I, I want to get ahead of that because things are going to change. Things, yeah. Formats get old. Topics get old. If you can't innovate, if you can't go into different realms, right? Do you always need to be scripted in order to make a video or it takes weeks for you to make a video, a perfect video? Or can you also speak on, off the cuff, be live and then entertain people? I feel like you have to build all sorts of skills. Doesn't mean that you have to try every different niche out there, but I think you need to build as much of an all round skill so that when tastes change, preferences change, audiences change, you can adapt and survive. The main reason why I think a lot of creators will fail is because they're not looking at YouTube as a business and thinking beyond YouTube, having a long-term vision and they're not able to innovate. Would you say those are like the two main things that a creator is required to think of to be able to create a long-term career on YouTube? That and just having something you stand for. Mm. That's why I set it out to make a mission statement very, very early on in the process because that's also going to guide the actions that I take to be able to innovate. I can innovate aimlessly, but then what the hell do I stand for? What are my values? What am I trying to accomplish? If I'm going to innovate, it should be a probably a natural progression of this mission I'm trying to to further. So I think having a, you know, at least some sort of clear direction. Yeah. Right. I think that's going to be very important. Just like any business has a mission statement. Yeah. That's, I think what I mean. I, I, I'm all for creativity. I love creativity. I wish we can all just be creative, but again, it's, it's a business. Let's look at it that way too. But I think again, if you go too businessy, right, mm -hmm. then the videos become generic. Yeah. Then how do you connect with your audience? How can anyone relate with you? Yeah. You're so corporate and buttoned up. Then the day it is still online media too. I think mm -hmm. the reason why it proliferated was because of the authenticity and, and, and connection you can build with your audience versus just seeing some random Hollywood star that comes out with the movie once in yeah. a while. Yeah. So I think the connection is different. And I think that's why YouTube's such a cool medium. But again, right? Like 
it's a business. Yeah. And I think because of what you just said, it's also so important to be conscious of the fact that like YouTube can make your business, but it can also destroy it overnight. So like going into it with the mindset of I want to use YouTube as a springboard for my business, just like I feel like there's an extra pressure there of what if you spent like a year putting all your effort into like this is what's going to help my business grow and then you make one slip up you know with like cancel culture and whatever it is I don't know there's always that possibility of like I don't want to say destroy your business but could really hinder it yeah. and then so making sure that you still have the foundations like outside of YouTube like you're not just relying on that yeah your business to survive you know yeah. um I, I think on that point too uh an another I guess controversial opinion is that I think YouTube is coming back in the sense of authenticity I think that's why Mr. Beast, for example, like, I guess the king of sensationalism, I look up to him in many different ways and how he's been able to build a business, but he's also created, like, not obviously a fault of his own, a bunch of Mr. Beast copycats in the sense of sensationalized content. I this, 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 this for 24 hours. And there's been thousands of those videos, but I think now it's reverting back to what made YouTube dope, like yeah. in the t early 2000s and, and, and later on, where it was like very authentic and you felt like you knew this guy that was behind the camera is a lot more like raw. I think that is coming back. But then along with that, I think some people are still carrying a lot of sensationalism with that, where they act so hard to be authentic. Mm -hmm. It took a lot cringy. Man. Yeah, it's yeah. true. And you brought up leadership before as well. How important is that for you, like the leadership side? And do you feel like, you know, you are a good leader to be able to build a vision that you set out? I've had to learn a lot in that aspect. I think one of the biggest realizations this past quarter is I think I've been doing a lot more ma managing instead of leading. But in order to scale your efforts, you need to lead, not manage. I think that comes with hiring the right people, with taking the right talent, and being and being able to free up my time so I can be more of a leader instead of like a manager. So it's definitely still something that I'm like, moving towards mm -hmm. but i would love to get to that point where i can really be that strong leader that can lead us to our vision you know, at the end of the day it's not about me right mm -hmm. it's about the mission it really really is so i think it's something i'm still cultivating and something i'm looking to incorporate more that i can uh, continue to drive forward with with time and effort but in your eyes what what makes a, a great leader? I think someone that's authentic, someone that lives out the values that you're trying to carry out through your mission, someone that's not also afraid to to demonstrate and talk about when they f***ed up, and, and someone who can be stable, man. <laughs> what, you had a technical difficulty and you're freaking out? You know, like, <laughs> come on, I, I need to work on that. Which ties back to the, you being authentic. Yeah. Going back to the convo we're having, nobody's perfect. Yeah. And if you're a leader, like owning up to that and being like, yeah, man, I was f***ing screaming at my computer <laughs> in front of, I don't know how many people yeah. watching, makes you so much more relatable. And people, I would, I feel like your team would be like rooting for you even more. I, I hope so. I think, yeah, there's still a lot that I need to mature as a person. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think it's more along making a culture too, where people can feel like they can also be a leader in their own way, mm. right? Bring innovation, tell me when I'm wrong. I don't want a team where they say, yes, Ken, yes, no, I'm not gonna accomplish anything. In fact, that's the quickest way to a downturn. So I think it's also up to me to create that environment where people feel comfortable in doing so. And then also picking the right people who can because some people will always be yes men. some people will maybe not speak up then i can't have that on my team think it's act quick fail fast but make the iterations it, it's okay to mis make a mistake but if you make it more than twice you're an idiot do you think that like leadership is a skill that any aspiring creator should already be trying to improve on like whether or not you want to create a business out of it or not just to get to the level of having a big channel because you're gonna have to hire a team yeah. at a certain point is what you're saying yeah um yeah do you think that that's an essential skill to already start cultivating? i think so for sure even if it's even if you just are going to only be the only person running your channel how are you going to lead your audience how are you going to you know back to what we were talking about communicate the things that you're looking to to preach or, or what you stand for how are you going to communicate that to your audience whether that be an extremely specific niche like rebuilding cars if you have some sort of thing that you stand for how are you going to lead your audience if you can't lead yourself so yeah i think leadership is fundamental in anything especially if you're a public figure i mean i think for me, what's also really interesting when I hear you talk about like the importance of team and 
you you have like 10-ish people on yeah, your team. Eight to 10, yeah. Which is crazy. Sticking to this theme of like hot takes, I feel like that's been a discussion that I've heard recently in the creator space as well. Of There is this income inequality where a lot of people in the creator space that come in and work uh, are almost exploited because of, you know, the fluctuating nature of YouTube. One month you can make a lot, one month you, you can make barely anything. If we had your eight, nine team members sitting here. And if we ask them, do you feel like you're contributed, you're compensated fairly for the work that you do with Gen? What do you feel like they would say? Damn. A <laughs> I'd be curious. I, I, I'd welcome that. I'm always up to discussion in terms of compensation, right? I have very transparent thoughts, especially with, let's say, my business manager or my creative director about that. I mean, I think we've been able to create a culture where we're able to really talk about that. But right, maybe if we're talking about my editor, I, I talk to him about that as well. Does he feel fairly compensated? You know, because the more talented you are, the more demand and offers you're going to get from elsewhere too, right? Especially if it's an industry. Honestly, uh, I'd like to think so. Um, based on the value they're providing, based on their their how new they've been, based on if I'm still having to train them, all that. And also maybe even relative to like the country that they live in as well. I like to think so. I'm sure everyone would always want to be paid more. And I'm curious, like from a logistical perspective and like, how are you able to manage, you know, nine different people <laughs> all across? My my team helps a lot too, right? Like whether it be my creative director okay. uh, or, or um, my business manager. We have a Discord server, right? Mm-hmm. We make it easy to, to communicate. And then I also have created pretty, you know, s- standard systems to create our videos. So then I think the communication becomes more streamlined too. How I'm curious about the systems. How detailed are your systems? So I have like, you know, outlines for every single type of video I make. These are the sort the story elements I really want. I have research documents. So for my research assistant, he plugs it into it. So then it makes it easier for my script writer to be able to take that and translate it into the flow of our storyboard template. I have SOPs for editors uh, that help and cut and organize like the footage equipped with videos, visuals, as well as text. You know, we use Notion, we use Discord to centralize our documents as well as communication. We also have quarterly calls quarterly meetings, just like you would as at a public company where we announce my wins, well, how I fell short of my goals, improvement opportunities, and, and all that. We just had one like a couple of weeks ago. So that also helps. And then also setting the right amount of meetings. Probably shouldn't be having weekly meetings with, let's say, my script writer. That's not necessary. But maybe like with me and my business manager, we, we should do that. And we've been fi- trying to find that balance. I think optimizing for time so we're not wasting anyone's time. And then as much as possible, making it so we can scale processes. So let's say if someone leaves, right, we also have those documents to minimize trading time. For like aspiring creators that do want to work with bigger creators like yourself, like how do they stand out? Like if someone's wanting to work with you, what would make them stand out for you to be like, I want to hire that person? I think it's uh, initiative and how they communicate is a pretty big giveaway, right? Because like usually an email or an Instagram DM is usually like the first an only impression that you get. For example, you guys probably even get a lot of emails yourselves from different agencies or editors like pinning you up. How are they writing that email? Are they have spelling errors? Do they say, oh, reply back and we'll tell you the special package that we have. I'm replying back to you. <laughs> what is this? Like, just tell me what it is. Like, for example, like if an editor reaches out and they have already created like a reel, obviously I'm going to check that out. And if it's great, then I'll be like, oh, mm-hmm. you know, we're maybe not even looking for an editor right now, but I'll definitely keep you on site yeah i think just like anything right like whenever i reach out to people that i want to interview i also try and keep that in mind i think getting a lot of inbound emails like cold emails like that also helps you discern what the best ones are which ones i clicked on which ones i actually followed up one versus ones that i haven't and i try and translate that whenever i want to get someone on a debate for a stream or I want to interview them for a main channel menu. How do you go about that phase of things actually like trying to get guests to feature on your channel and are they usually like do they have some sort of extra expertise are they just you know, regular people. It depends on the video. I usually try and get like an experts as well as street interviews to really add some depth to the story. And whenever I do that, I try and get both sides of experts, right? To make it fair. For me, like I'm curious, cause also with what we do, I think a lot of other creators like are more and more moving into the di- direction of like podcasting or, you know, featuring other people. So like, how do you, how are you able to 
get people that are interesting. Yeah. I, I think what, what's helped too, even on my early stage, uh, when I was able to interview some bigger creators, when I was at like 300 subscribers, is also just having a clear direction, not only of the video, mm -hmm. but then also what you stand for. I always send my admission statement whenever I reach out. I think that sets me apart. Oh, like this means something. I can see where he's going with this. I think it becomes more genuine and personalized. Um, when you can have that kind of mission statement to fall back to. We send our mission statement also to every of the potential outbound um, sponsors that we that we send emails to. Mm -hmm. So I think things like that where you make it clear where you're coming from mm -hmm. takes a little bit of the suspicion mm -hmm. as well as mystery um, out of it. So mm -hmm. it becomes, again, that much easier and seamless to work with you. I mean, one thing that I also we talked about is you, how you feel like the YouTube space is not represented as best as it could be yeah i think there's a there's a huge market for people who get interviewed creators and mm. really get to the core of it instead of like very surface level questions mm. that's my personal opinions so that's why i was genuinely excited about doing this interview i think it's a cool cool format i think you guys asked some really really good questions and it came from a genuine place um and it wasn't like basic traditional questions it, it really like made me think a lot of the times too i wasn't just sweating uh, <laughs> because of the uh, as of no AC or whatever, I was just like, damn, that's a good question. How am I going to answer this and look good in front of camera? I think there's a, there's a big uh, market for that, for sure. Okay. So you guys are the ones to, to fill it. Hey, I appreciate that. Yeah. Dude, honestly, that means a lot. When you told us at Vid Summit as well, for us, it was like, you know, that when you hear someone you respect oh, tell you something like that as well, it's like, it's a good source of motivation. So yeah, I appreciate that for sure. So it's, is it time to pull it off? I feel like I think it is. Wait, so do I just pull it off? Yeah. Did it take anything out? It's actually not that bad. Oh, uh, guys, I thought it was going to be a... Yeah, it wasn't bad. Ah. I think it's because... Oh, whoa, I actually... Oh, yeah, I have a lot. Yeah, there's oh, a lot. Oh, my God. I'm a mess. Oh. <laughs> okay, wait, never mind. Mine is not much. 